By the way, it's nothing to do with expansion, but what sort of process makes the wire vibrate like this, do you think, when it gets hot? When the wire cools again, once more it contracts to its original length. It's possible to measure the expansion of a metal and find what's called its coefficient of linear expansion, or expansivity. We use this apparatus in the lab, and more accurate methods in industry and research use the same principle. We're going to measure the expansion of brass in the form of this brass tube. Let's look at the back. Just here, there's a thin metal shaft, a sort of axle. When the brass tube expands, it will rub against this shaft, causing it to rotate. The dial attached to the shaft will rotate with it. At the bottom, supporting the brass tube, there's an accurately made micrometer screw. One complete turn of this screw pushes up the brass tube exactly one millimeter. There's the dial rotating as the brass rubs against the shaft. We must note the dial reading when the brass tube has moved that one millimeter. It's 53, 53. Now we measure the length of the brass tube from the point where it rests on the micrometer screw to the point where it just touches the shaft of the dial. It's nearly 43.8 centimeters say 43.75 centimetres. This thermometer measures room temperature. The brass tube will be at this temperature. It's 25.7 degrees C. 25.7. We're going to boil water in this vessel so that the steam passes through the brass tube and heats it up. A thermometer up here will give us the temperature of the steam. Here we go. After five minutes or so, the water's boiling. Steam will now pass into the brass tube and heat it up. This will cause it to expand, rotating the shaft and moving the dial. Watch. It's now expanded as much as it's going to. We must note the new dial reading. It's 34, 34. The brass tubing is now at this temperature. About 99.3 degrees C, 99 Point three. Later, you can work out the coefficient of linear expansion of brass. It's important, for engineers especially, to know how much different materials expand on heating. Railway track expands on warm days and contracts when it's colder. On the old-fashioned type of track, gaps are left between each 60-foot length to allow for this. There'll be another gap 60 feet away. Modern track is welded into 600-foot lengths or more. This needs a much bigger gap to allow for expansion, so the joints are arranged like this. You can see how the rails can slide past each other as they expand or contract. Those lengths in the middle keep the whole section rigid wherever there's a joint. So on modern track, there's only a joint every 600 feet or more.
The concrete beams used in many big civil engineering projects also expand and contract with changing temperature. Gaps have to be left to allow for this. There's going to be a road surface laid on top of these beams, part of a big new motorway interchange above the railway. But you can't leave open gaps. They'd fill up with debris, and then they couldn't fulfill the purpose they're intended for. So the gaps are filled with flexible plastic material, as you can see. And the beams are laid on strips of flexible plastic, which will give as they move, because of expansion or contraction, or with traffic vibration. This section is nearly finished. Once again, we can see where gaps have been left, filled with flexible plastic sheeting, so that they don't get jammed up with bits of grit or other solid particles. This is the stuff they use. It comes in sheets which are trimmed into shape. Without such precautions, structures like this would crack and split with the stresses caused by temperature changes and vibration. In big steel structures like this motorway bridge, there's even more movement caused by expansion and contraction. This is how it's allowed for. The girders rest on these rollers. Here's one seen from inside, just below the bridge. This is how they work. When the temperature rises, the long metal girders expand, and this happens. When it's colder, the girders contract and the roller tilts the other way. Here we are under the bridge again. Above the rollers, there are special expansion joints in the roadway. On the surface, they look like this. The metal combs interlace with each other like fingers, moving in when it's hot, sliding out a little when it's cold, but always bridging the gap between the two sections of the bridge. The ends of the bridge also rest on sets of rollers, so that they can move as the metal expands or contracts. And there's another sort of expansion joint in the roadway above. Watch out for devices like this on any big civil engineering project. They're an essential part of the design if the structure is to remain safe. If you visit an electricity generating station, you'll notice how movement caused by metals expanding and contracting and by vibration is allowed for. The huge pipes, for example, aren't fixed rigidly to anything. They're suspended by strong steel cables with big springs to allow for movement. Otherwise, they'd soon split under the strain as they were heated up on starting the turbo generators and with the vibration caused by the hot steam rushing through them. See how this great steam pipe is mounted on heavy metal springs. Here's the front end of one of the high pressure turbines. The whole long chain of machinery forming the turbo generator expands when in use and contracts on cooling. It's fixed in the middle but can slide over greased metal plates at the ends, like this one. The machinery expands in this direction when it gets hot it can slide on this heavy metal plate. This bracket's fixed to the machinery, and you can see from the scale on the base plate that movement has taken place. Again, without precautions to allow for movement caused by expansion and vibration, this vast plant would quickly wreck itself. So far, we've been dealing with the problems caused by thermal expansion, but we can make use of the phenomenon. You've probably seen a demonstration like this. This is a bimetallic strip, brass on one side, fixed to steel on the other. Now, brass expands more than steel for a given temperature rise. 
So if we heat up the bimetallic strip, this happens. On cooling, it straightens out again. Here's a use for bimetallic strips in the direction indicators of motor cars. When we switch them on, current flows in a coil of wire wrapped around a tiny bimetallic strip. This heats up the strip so that it expands and bends and makes an electrical contact which lights up the flasher bulb. But at the same time, this cuts off the heating current, so it straightens out again and breaks the connection with the bulb. But this restores contact with the heater current, and the strip bends again, and so on, and so on, until we switch off. Other flasher units work in different ways. Examine one for yourself to see exactly how it works. Making use of thermal expansion again, and again in connection with the motor car. This toothed ring is the ring gear which fits around the flywheel of a car engine. It engages with the starter motor when you switch on the engine. It's accurately made to be completely circular, like the flywheel. But as you saw, it's just a bit too small to fit. So it's heated up. After some time, it has expanded, uniformly, because it's accurately machined. Now, it should just fit onto the flywheel. It does, and as it cools, it will contract and grip the flywheel so tightly that it will have to be machined off if it has to be replaced again. Instead of heating something and shrinking it on, we can do the opposite. This ball race will not fit onto the shaft. Each has been accurately machined, but they don't quite fit each other. We place the shaft in liquid nitrogen. This will cool the shaft to minus 196 degrees C, and the metal will contract. After 10 minutes or so, we take it out, and now it will fit into the ball race. We leave it to warm up again. The shaft has now expanded to its former size and there's no way we could get the ball race off. Let's look at an application of this liquid nitrogen technique in railway engineering at British Rail Engineering Limited's crew works. They're working on the cylinder block from the engine of a diesel electric locomotive. These holes take the cylinder liners, but they've been drilled to make them circular again after they've gone out of shape in use. Metal inserts are used to narrow the holes down to their original diameter again. They won't fit until they've been cooled in liquid nitrogen to make them contract. The circular channel is now full of liquid nitrogen at nearly 200 degrees C below zero. The insert is put into it for 10 minutes or so. It has now contracted and should just fit into the cylinder block. Let's see. And there it goes, neatly into place. 
when it warms up to ordinary temperature again, it will expand and fit very tightly into place in the block. Here's another application of thermal expansion on the railways. There are metal tyres on the wheels of many locomotives and other rolling stock, which get worn by friction against the rails. Here's a new tyre for a wheel on a big diesel electric locomotive. It's heated by gas jets all around it to make it expand so that it will just fit over the wheel. It's now ready to take the wheel. When the tyre cools, it will contract onto the wheel and stay there, just like the ring gear on that motor car engine flywheel earlier on. These high-speed trains don't have tyres. The entire wheels are in one piece of tough steel. But the same technique, shrink fitting, is used to fix the wheels onto the axles. These wheels have been heated in an electric oven. They're accurately machined with centre holes just too small to fit on the axle. But when the wheel's been heated so that it expands, it will fit. Watch. They've got to work quickly. Can you think why? And here it goes. When the wheel cools, it shrinks onto the axle and needs no other... In this film, we're going to look at different kinds of electromagnetic radiation and see some of their uses we shall look at parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's a light source. It's actually a xenon discharge lamp. We're going to use it to produce a spectrum. There's the light, a condensing lens, and a hollow glass prism which contains a liquid called carbon disulfide. The prism disperses the white light into its separate wavelengths, producing a visible spectrum on the screen. Red on the left, then the wavelengths getting smaller as we pass to blue-violet on the right. If we pass an electrical discharge through mercury vapour, a lot of radiation with a wavelength less than the wavelength of blue light is produced. It's part of the invisible spectrum below the blue, which stretches away beyond this end of the visible spectrum. It starts about here. It's called ultraviolet radiation, and you can't see it. We can only see here the blue light also produced by the discharge tube. But if ultraviolet, UV, radiation falls on certain substances called phosphors, it's absorbed and its energy is turned into visible light of longer wavelength, which of course we can see. This is how the fluorescent tubes work, which are so often used to provide illumination in the home and in industry, like the control room of this power station. Just beyond the other end of the visible spectrum, there's another kind of invisible radiation with a longer wavelength than the visible red. We can use this detector to pick it up. It's called infrared radiation, and when it falls on the detector, it will cause a small electric current to flow. Nothing happens in the visible part of the spectrum, but when we reach here, just outside the red, look, a current passes. Go further and the current falls. The peak of this invisible infrared radiation is here. It's electromagnetic radiation, just like visible light, but it's got a longer wavelength and we can't see it. Let's go back for a moment to ordinary visible light. 
These three lasers are aimed at a large concave mirror at the other end of a long box, which can be filled with smoke. Turn out the lights and switch on the laser beams. When they hit the concave mirror, they're reflected like this to meet at the focus of the mirror on the right. You'll have seen ray diagrams like this in books. The reflection of light at a concave mirror. Now we're going to show that infrared radiation behaves in exactly the same way. The electrical radiant heater element on the right takes the place of the lasers and there's a parabolic mirror. Infrared radiation streams off from the heater onto the mirror and is reflected to the mirror's focus, where there's the head of a live match. After the heat has been on a short time, let's watch it again. Reflected infrared radiation is being concentrated by the mirror onto the head of the match. We can prove that it's radiation reflected from the mirror which is igniting the match by putting this mask, black on one side and shiny on the other, between match and mirror. Nothing happens until the mask's moved away. Infrared radiation behaves like visible light because it's part of the same electromagnetic spectrum. This is the focal point of a different kind of concave mirror designed to bring to focus electromagnetic radiation of even longer wavelength than infrared. It's a radio telescope picking up radiation, short radio waves, sent out by the stars. We're going to aim it at the sun. We can't see the sun on this overcast morning, but the radio waves coming from it will be reflected by the dish of the telescope onto the aerial at its focus, and our instruments will tell us when this is happening. We're coming onto it now. Here's the peak signal coming up as the telescope points directly at the invisible sun. then it falls again as the dish moves off target. Radio waves form yet another part of the electromagnetic spectrum, behaving in many ways like the light waves we're all familiar with. It's just their different, longer wavelength which distinguishes them from infrared and visible light. Here at Jodrell Bank in Cheshire, there are far bigger radio telescopes than the one we've just seen in action. Radio waves, like infrared, behave in many ways as visible light does, because they're part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This giant dish is simply an enormous mirror, gathering radio waves from stars in outer space, or signals from man-made satellites when it's tracking a space shot, and reflecting them onto a detector as its focus. Radio telescopes are used to investigate processes going on in distant parts of the universe, They've given astronomers information which they could never have obtained using optical telescopes, although both visible light and radio waves belong to the same continuous spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Here's a demonstration which shows that the short-wave radio waves, called microwaves, do have some of the same properties as visible light. A laser again, shining through a milky fluid to show up the beam with a glass prism in the centre. You all know that a prism refracts light. Here you can see this actually happening. Can we refract microwaves, shortwave radio waves? On the right, there's a microwave transmitter, beamed at a microwave receiver in line with it, with a meter on the left. Switch on, and the deflection of the needle shows that microwaves are reaching the receiver. They can be blocked off quite easily. Watch. These are 2.8 centimetre waves, but you can find out all the wavelengths of the different kinds of radiation for yourselves afterwards. 
If we now move the detector round like this, the microwaves no longer hit the target, as the galvanometer needle shows. Back into line again, and the detector picks up the microwaves. This prism contains liquid paraffin, which does not absorb microwaves. They pass through it, but they're refracted. Their path is bent, as you can see. The detector has to be moved round to pick them up. This is exactly the same effect that we saw with visible light. Here's something else we can demonstrate. We swivel the prism round to a different position, like this. Now we've got to bring the detector round until it's at a right angle to the transmitter to pick up the microwave signal. There. Here's the plan view, with the transmitter on the right and the detector bottom left. The microwaves are being reflected from the inner face of the prism, like this. We call this total internal reflection. And if you look at the prism, you can see a reflection of the transmitter. Light is undergoing the same total internal reflection. Both visible light waves and invisible microwaves are being reflected from the inside face of the prism. They're behaving in the same way because they're both part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's an important application of the total internal reflection of light. This is a light source. If we plug in this flexible tubing, look, light comes out at the end. The light has somehow gone round all the corners to emerge at the end. If we look at the end, we see that there's a bundle of fine glass fibres. Light passes along each fibre, undergoing total internal reflection, like this. There's actually a bundle of such fibres, and they're covered round the outside with black plastic. Here's a medical instrument which makes use of fibre optics, as it's called. Light passes down a set of fibres around the outside, leaving fibres in the middle to carry back an image of whatever the probe is looking at. This lady's larynx is being examined. The probe's passed up her nose and down into her throat. The doctor can move it around and get good clear views. These are her vocal cords. Vibration of these produces the sounds of speech. Looking further down towards the entrances to her lungs. Using instruments like this, many different parts of the body can be examined. a brief glimpse of the vocal cords again. This is a very exciting view. Those rings are muscle. The total internal reflection of light in those bundles of glass fibres being applied in medicine to find out if anything's wrong. Another application of reflection, this time of short radio waves, microwaves at a television station. At the top of this mast, there's an aerial to receive shortwave transmissions from outside broadcast units. The waves are channeled down from the top by wave guides. Here's a short section of one. It's made of metal and it's hollow, with polished inside surfaces, as you can see. There's a long straight wave guide passing up the mast. The microwaves are kept travelling down inside the waveguides by internal reflection. They can be carried around corners by units like this. They pass round the corner, reflected from inside face to inside face. And this section can be bent to fit any required path. A simple physics principle again, applied to broadcasting.
Another example. We're going to use a microwave oven to heat up the 200 millilitres of water in this beaker. The probe tells us that it's at present at 18 degrees C. Into the oven and we switch on and start a stop clock. While the water's being heated in the oven, let's look inside one of these microwave ovens. There's a microwave generator at the back and the microwaves, which have a wavelength of 12.2 centimetres, are carried inside waveguides to the inside. Internal reflection again. You can see the two slots by which the microwaves enter the oven. There and there. This arrangement would simply direct two microwave beams downwards to the floor of the oven. So this thing, like a fan, is used. The revolving blades act as mirrors, scattering the microwaves throughout the interior of the oven so that they're absorbed by the things we wish to cook or just heat up, wherever these are in the oven. That water is now boiling. After one minute, 11 seconds, we take it out. And you can see what's happened. The water's absorbed the microwaves and their energy has been converted into heat, which is how microwave ovens work. To finish with, let's look at more electromagnetic radiation with a lower wavelength than light, beyond the blue-violet end of the visible spectrum and beyond even the ultraviolet. This is a simple X-ray tube. It's connected to the high voltage leads from an induction coil. There's gas at very low pressure inside the glass tube. When the high voltage is applied, electrons stream off from this negative electrode, the cathode. When they hit this positive electrode, an anode, X radiation is produced. It streams off from this anode. When we switch on and put the lights out, we can see a dim blue glow. Some light is produced, but we can't see the X-rays. They're part of the electromagnetic spectrum, with wavelengths much, much smaller than those of visible light. X-rays can damage living things, so we put a lead shield in front of the X-ray tube, with a circular aperture to let through a beam of radiation. This is a fluorescent screen. When X-rays strike it, they produce light on the screen. We put it in front of the aperture. Now for a demonstration. A cardboard box will be almost transparent to X-rays. They'll pass right through it. But these metal pliers will stop the X-rays. We place the box between the X-ray tube and the fluorescent screen. And there's a shadow of the pliers thrown by the X-rays on the fluorescent screen and you can just see the edge of the box. X-rays are of course used a lot in medicine. This girl is having an X-ray picture taken in hospital. A photographic plate is placed beneath the bed she's lying on and her position is arranged so that the X-ray tube will send a beam of X-rays through her onto the plate. Now a short dose of X-rays will do no harm to the patient, but the radiographer works in here for long periods so she operates the equipment from behind a shield. Otherwise, she'd be exposed to X-rays every single time she dealt with a patient, which could harm her. Now a picture at this angle. When the plates are developed, we get results like this one. It's a negative, by the way. Bones are opaque to X-rays, they stop them, so we can see the ribs quite clearly and part of the spine. Other parts show up too. Here's the diaphragm and the outline of the heart. Morning, Miss Moonan. Morning. How are you? Fine, thank you.
Now, this radiologist is going to x-ray the girl's stomach. Now, the stomach is transparent to x-rays, so she has to drink a liquid containing a substance called barium sulfate, which is opaque to x-rays. This will coat the inside of her stomach for a time, and the radiologist will be able to get outlined pictures of it and see if there's anything wrong. He has to stay in the room whenever he does such examinations, so he wears a very heavy apron containing lead to shield him, or he'll get a dangerous dose of x-rays over the years. Here comes the barium drink. Right, turn a little bit away from me. A bit more, turn your feet. That's it, stay like that. You can see yourself in that monitor up there if you want to. Right, now, start drinking now, please. Watch it go down when she swallows. And again. That's fine. Here's the stomach filling up. That's all for now. Just keep quite still. X-rays, like the ultraviolet, infrared, microwave and radio waves, are in the great continuous series of which the visible spectrum forms only a small part. These are all forms of electromagnetic radiation, some properties of which we've looked at in this film. This is the first of two films about the physics of movement, including some important applications in the world around us. We shall be finding out about the laws of motion.